Happy Halloween. I dressed up as a speaker for Trick or Treat. They put me on stage. <laughs> One of the downsides of the mostly awesome thing about being human is our ability to worry about the future. We know it's out there, but are not necessarily sure what's going to happen in it. If you can ask any of the speakers today, that can be a paralyzing fear, uncertainty. Well, that feeling recently wrecked a Bunko game. And just so you know, Bunko is code for snacks and gossip. <laughs> Busted ladies. So Cassie was sitting there in between roles, and she said, my daughter's decided to be a history major. Who gets a paying job in history? Becky says, that's nothing. My kid decided to dump college altogether, go pour concrete. Janice, whose kids are more the furry, four-legged variety, she said, at least your husbands aren't thinking about investing your life savings and opening a new self-storage facility. Pam, during this whole conversation, was dead silent. She was a solar canvasser, so she knocked on doors all day to sell solar. Hated it. Hated it. And she was trying to figure out if now was the right time for her to quit her job and go after this fairly cushy sales gig with a, a pretty well-respected assisted living facility nearby. So she was just mulling it over and not paying attention at all. At that moment, there was very little bunko actually happening. It was just gossip. At that moment, my friends really, really, really would have killed to have a crystal ball, just to get some glimpse of the future. If there's ever a time when uncertainty feels particularly crummy, other than when you're about to take stage, it's when you or your kids are making really big decisions. So they would have loved to be able to see the future. In actuality, they could. They just didn't know it yet. As luck would have it, we humans are pretty predictable. We drive around the age of 16. We get married, about 27 or so. That's first marriages, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> in most cases. Not the third or fourth. In our mid-30s, we're raising families, buying houses, all of that. Unless you were trying to sell your house in 2008, in which case you could not find someone to buy your house to save your life. In our 40s is when we buy the most cars, mostly because that's the period of time when we're shepherding our kids to and from about six million activities. Puts a lot of miles on the car. And when we're 50, we buy a boat. I don't know why. My husband is celebrating. He's like, yes, the boat. I don't know why we buy boats at 50, but we do. So if you're 50 and you're here, you haven't got your boat yet, tick tock. Move it along. Now, I should say that there is a very, very small contingent of 30-year-old Candy Crush developers that are buying $5 million yachts. The rest of us have to wait till we're 50. <laughs> about mid-50, early 60s or so, most of us think about downsizing. Now, there are exceptions, but at that point, most of us want less vacuuming. So we want to scale it down. In our 70s, being healthy and staying in our homes long term becomes a major priority. And beyond that, we start to rely on others to take care of us. And all the full-grown adults in the audience with curfews tonight because your parents are living with you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Most predictably of all is the fact that we age. Except for me. <laughs> in a blink, we go from starting our families to starting our retirement. So future predicting comes into play 
when we can figure out how many people are at those different age ranges at any given time. And that's where I bring you a chart. <laughs> this chart is a record of the live births in the United States over about 100 years, okay? It's broken up into 20-year age segments, with the oldest on the chart being 110, and the youngest being 10. P.S. This is also the generational breakdown. That's a talk for another day. It is a wavy line that shows us that sometimes we have huge groups of people, and sometimes we have very small groups of people. Now, when I present this, what I'm mostly asked is, why are those groups so small? Well, this small group of 70 to 90-year-olds was born during the Great Depression. It was not a good idea to have a lot of mouths to feed during the Great Depression. This group, small group of 30 to 50-year-olds, of which I am a part, thank you very much, me and about six other people, this group was affected by a couple of different things. The first one was a concept at the time called zero population growth. It took root in 1968, probably as a reaction to the fact that we had just had the biggest generation in the history of the United States, probably a little crowded. So the zero population growth concept came into being, and that really talked about people's responsibility to control the size of their families, to control overcrowding, control pollution, and control the stress on our country's infrastructure. Okay? The second thing that caused this small group of people was the women's movement. You remember that song? I am woman, hear me what you remember it? Helen Reddy, is it? Yeah. I'm not gonna sing it. <laughs> Thank you. 1972 the women's movement really came into being. And this celebrated a woman's right to make her life anything she wanted it to be. Whether it meant having a family or not having a family at all, whether it meant having a lot of cats. This empowered the woman's right to choose her future. Last but not least, Roe v. Wade, 1973, making it legal to terminate a pregnancy. Now, political stances aside, all of these things conspired to give us a very small group of people, okay? Now, if you think about all the stuff we need as humans, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, all that stuff, big groups need more stuff, right? More people. More people to put clothes on. Small groups need less stuff fewer people. So this chart can show you demand for any given thing at any given time. That small group of 30 to 50 year olds probably had something to do with the fact that you couldn't find many people to buy your house in 2008. Too small of a group, okay? So this is when our bunko game turned into a treasure hunt. If we could figure out how many people there were needing history lessons, needing self-storage facilities, needing concrete, and needing assisted living, we could predict the future of those choices. From 8 to 24 is when we need our history lessons. From primary school all the way through college, we mostly hate learning about history. Or maybe that was just me, I'm not sure. This group is amidst the biggest population in U.S. history. There are more people needing history lessons right now than there have been in the past 20 years. Also, teachers teaching history are leaving the profession in droves. Mostly because, number one, they've worked long and hard and deserve retirement. Number two, the other reason is they don't want to deal with this mountain of kids. This mountain of kids means 
bigger classrooms, harder to manage. It means higher educational standards in bigger classrooms that are harder to manage. And a lot of folks are saying, yeah, check please. So if Cassie's history major decided to become a history teacher or professor, her future could be amazing. Also, add on to that, that we are right now undergoing probably one of the biggest educational reinventions in modern history because there are so many kids and because there are so few teachers. This has brought on the advent of charter schools all over the place. It's caused a surge in homeschooling and has also brought into play remote learning. Online universities, online education systems. Somebody's saying, yes. So Cassie's daughter's future could be kind of fun too, as well as profitable. Cassie didn't feel as bad about her history major after that. The next one was Becky's son. He decided to chuck college altogether. He attended for a little bit and said, Ma, this isn't for me. And he went to pour concrete. So we looked on the chart. At about the age of hmm, 32 to 35, we really start to build some traction in our careers and we start to have some resources to chuck at pools and houses. We also rely on the condition of our daily commute, all of which need concrete. So Becky's kid is positioned in front of the same mountain of people who will need history lessons. If he's a hard worker, has good skills, his future could be amazing in concrete. By this time, Janice saw the writing on the wall for self-storage. The time at which we mostly rent self-storage units is when we start to downsize our houses and don't want to get rid of our stuff. That's about 54. It's 54-year-old men, to be exact. <laughs> there are boats and cars in that storage facility. I know there are. The problem is, 54-year-olds are perched on a population cliff. That was the small group of 30 to 50-year-olds. If Janice and her husband decided to build a new self-storage facility now, they would be trying to sell their services to fewer and fewer people for, wait for it, 25 years. <laughs> Not the time to invest in a new self-storage facility. Janice asked me to tell her husband. Pam. I totally get why Pam hates her job. She knocks on doors all day long to hear no more often than any human being should. And she wanted to know what the prospects were like for that assisted living sales job that had been a pretty cushy gig for a long time. The average age of a new assisted living resident is 84. It's an 84-year-old woman. 84-year-olds are perched on a similar population cliff. These are the Great Depression babies. So, the 84-year-olds over the next 10 years would be fewer and fewer. If Pam went into that sales job now, she would be selling her services amid a shrinking market that does not a happy sales manager make. So the prospect for her assisted living job was not that great. On the bright side, so to speak, the same group of people that'll be keeping Becky's kid busy in concrete would also be excellent candidates for solar. So Pam decided to make an investment in a really good future and keep knocking on doors. The bottom line to all of this is they had a crystal ball. It's simply a matter of figuring out how many people there are in a corresponding age group to see whether it's going to be a boom or a bust, right? And I didn't invent this. All of this information is publicly available 
at the National Center for Health Statistics and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Anybody has access to this. And what I would like to leave you with, other than your own crystal ball masquerading as a US birth chart, pick the thing that allows you to serve the greatest number of people. It won't be a guarantee of success, but sure does help. Thank you. Thank you.